It's too loud. <laughs> uh, I would like to welcome you here, and I would like to welcome uh, Keith Kessler, is right? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, who is an open source software evangelist, evangelist, developer, and an architect. He has created Java architectures for uh, large scalable high transaction load systems. Uh, Heath has uh, been a team uh, lead in many projects, uh, recovery uh, impl implementations, helping to rescue systems on the verge of collapse. He has been involved with the architecture and implementation of large scale enterprise systems throughout the world. He conducts trainings on how to use open source frameworks to integrate messaging and services. Heath enjoys pushing the envelope by finding new ways to implement solutions using cutting edge technologies for old and new platforms. Heath has spoken at conferences at all over the world and he has been selected as a 2012 Java One Rockstar. He has uh, been an active contributor to several Apache frameworks and a committer to on Coraf. And he is also the co-author of the, of the book Learning Apache Coraf. Uh, please welcome Heath. Hello. Thank you. He had that memorized, by the way. The phone was just a prop. Um, no, welcome. This is a, a session on designing and architecting enterprise quality systems. It's a generic look at some of the common architectures that we come across uh, at many of our different clients that we work with throughout the world, actually. Uh, was anybody here uh, at the session that talked about putting together uh, a country with open source? Yeah, Johan, of course. Okay, excellent. Uh, a lot of these, these principles that you'll see in here are just a generic look at some of the same concepts. Um, so if you missed it, you didn't miss much. No, I'm just kidding, Jeff. <laughs> He's right up here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Who am I? I'm a Carafe committer. I also contribute to Camel, ActiveMQ. Um, I do a lot of evangelism with open source because there's, to me, there's not a problem that we have come across that could not be solved by open source. I mean, to me, it's just there's there's so many possibilities with the open source community that if it doesn't exactly do what you need it to do, you can make it do what you need it to do, and then push it back to the community, which is to me the the best part of all of this. I also develop and architect systems. Uh, mostly the reason why this picture is up there because it looks badass, but it's really not as cool as it looks. There's, there's a slight altercation at the, at the bottom down there that you can notice if you look closely. But the idea behind this is that the point of it is to show you that not everything is as it seems in SOA. You know, it seems like you can always complicate things to the nth degree with these architectures. And what I'm going to show you today greatly simplifies a lot of these systems. If you start off with a, with a basic quality architecture and build on it, you're going to save yourself tons of time and tons of trouble as you get further down the line. What this presentation is meant to show you is how, how, do you, how can you get a good start with a good quality architecture and, and get all the pieces that most systems need in an inter enterprise quality system. Um, I'm also called in to do a lot of firefighting because a lot of times people don't come to these conferences and put together or, or look at these architectures. So what they do is they go out and they grab something off open source. Hey, we need a messaging system. Let's get ActiveMQ. They don't take the time to look and see what is it going to take to actually architect our system correctly. Um, I love those. The reason being is that usually about six months later I get a phone call um, because they're, they've set things up. Things are failing. It's not running right. It's ActiveMQ's fault. There's something wrong with it. It doesn't work right. And um, most of the time, I'm not going to say every single time, but I would say most of the time that the, the fault does not lie in the architecture of the framework. Most of the time it's in the source code written against it. So I like those. So I love firefighting. So what we're going to talk about today is some of the basic pieces of, these, of a common architecture in an enterprise system. So the first part we'll talk about or take a look at is the integration piece. How do you get all these different systems to talk to each other in a common way that doesn't um, cause you a lot of headache from the standpoint of one, testing, implementation, um, time to production, things like that. Uh, uh, also with um, migration plans. 
how do you get your systems to update, things like that, without causing a lot of downtime in a production environment. Mediation routing. So what do you do with the data once you have it? How are, how are you pulling, doing enrichment, that kind of thing. Um, Wiretapping, all those kinds of concepts from um, like the Gang of Four, putting together the EIPs. Messaging, how do you communicate between these systems? What's a good way of, of implementing a, a messaging system so that you, one, get high availability? So in case something happens within your network or something like that, you don't lose everything that's going on. High availability, which I just mentioned. Um, making sure that your system is always available. Production times. That's very important in a lot of these cases. You don't want anything happening that's going to bring down your system. You want to continue functioning at any failure. And then, of course, OSGI, which is the, the elephant in the room in my, my terms. Mostly because this is the one thing that a lot of people take a look at and go, hey, I, I don't understand that. Um, you know, it brings too many complications to the table. And we'll take a look at kind of what that means. This is one of the big culprits of that, Spring versus Blueprint. The reason being is that people will take their current development or their current um, application using Spring and try to throw it into an OSGI container. It doesn't work. You can kind of get it to work, but if you look at Spring's website, itself, they even say that it's not supported. And then, of course, the ESB, which is the buzzword. Everybody loves to say, ooh, I got a, I've got an ESB. I'm on the bus. I'm riding the bus. <laughs> you know? So we'll take a look at kind of what some of that stuff means. The basic architecture we're going to go over today is this. This is, this is kind of the layout of what we're going to talk about today. This kind of follows a software as a service type of architecture. So what we've got, and I'm going to walk up here so I can point to stuff and blind myself at the same time. Um, we've got a basic interface. So in this case, we're talking about a web service call, REST call, whatever, um, onto the, the enterprise service bus. All this is is really a proxy. It's going to be your, how you expose your endpoints to the, to the outside world. Uh, what are the different services you want to provide to them and give them availability to? And then you've got a messaging system. This is what uh, handles the load. So if you get a large number of calls coming in at, at any certain time of the day or evening, that kind of thing, this is where you can handle that. And then you've got your logic layer. <clears throat> this is the system. This is the piece where ever, all your work is done. This is the heavy lifting. And there's a separation of work here. And you'll see why as we get further along. So if we look at the proxy, the proxy is going to be something that's very simple easy to implement. There shouldn't be a lot, whole lot of uh, work being done here. Mostly what you're doing is you're accepting a, you know, a, a request of some sort, maybe doing some transformation to it, and then pushing it out to, to a messaging system. That makes it fast, lightweight, and it can scale separately from the rest of the system. Now there are some things we're doing transforms or something like that at this layer is perfectly okay, but the idea there is to make this as lightweight as possible. And then setting up the high availability active MQ session. That way, if for some reason one of your active MQ instances goes, goes down, another one will fire up within seconds. You're off and running. The front end um, clients won't even see that something happened. And then the logic layer. And this is just an example of some, I've actually got the code for this. All this does is kind of demonstrate a basic camel route. In this case, we're doing aggregation. So we're splitting off to multiple different endpoints. Uh, simultaneously, so you can do, run multiple uh, processes at the same time, aggregate the results from those processes, and send it back. That way you're basically multi-threading your, your um, camel route. So you're doing several processes at the same time. And we'll take a look at, at the code that implements this a little bit later. So messaging. There's multiple ways to do messaging within ActiveMQ and setting up high availability. This is the one you don't want to do, and I'll explain why. Most of the time when you set up a master-slave, here with ActiveMQ, we have two different stores that are being defined. So you have a master, the message comes in. That message also has to be persi um, persisted here on the slave as well as here on the master. So you're paying twice for the cost of this high availability. Now it is fast. So if for some reason this master goes down, the failover to the slave is almost instantaneously. But 
you pay for that with a price because now if you want to get back, if let's say if the master goes down and the slave is now taken over, he's not considered a master at that point. At this point, he's still a slave, but he's got all the traffic. In order to get back to this configuration, you now have to turn on the master, well, basically not turn on, you have to shut down the slave, copy any data from this store over to this store, turn on the master, and then turn the slave back on. You've got downtime. Not an ideal scenario. So that's why this is not the best case scenario for high availability. Not only that, but you have configuration changes. So your configuration has to specifically state which one is the master, which one is the slave. So on the slave, you're telling it, here's my master connector. So your configurations are now different from master and slave. So again, not ideal, because now you've got different configurations for different machines. This is the one that is normally going to be recommended. This is kind of our go-to process or architecture for setting up ActiveMQ. We have a master, we have a slave, they both point to the same persistent store. What that provides is high availability from the standpoint that whoever gets lock on this persistence, which is, which is a, a, a file lock, so you just point these two to the same file location, whether it's a SAN, um, <clears throat> you can even do it on your laptop, it doesn't really matter, as long as it's the same file location and you're, you're mapped and you're good to go. Now once whichever ActiveMQ comes up first is the one that becomes the master. So he's going to sit there and he's going to you know, process messages, get messages in, send messages out. Something happens that, that 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 slave or that master goes down, the slave will pick up, catch the file lock opening, pick up the, the persistence lock, and start processing. Absolutely nothing has to be done from your side. So it's completely hands off. Now, restarting of what was the master at, at one time or, or another, that's up to, you know, you can use scripts for that, you can have manual intervention, whatever. But as you can see, that makes it very streamlined. It doesn't require anybody to be on, online saying, okay, we've got to switch over, we've got to fail this over, we've got to do this, we've got to do that. You don't have to do that. Correct, but when you say redundancy of store, that's, it's still, it's still a, um, the same store that's going to be utilized. The only difference is, is that if something happens to your store, in this case, yes, you're in trouble. But the idea is something like a SAN or high um, you know, re redundancy systems where you can persist this, where that it takes care of itself. Because now you're, you're simplifying your messaging layer. So yeah, there's, so, yes. I mean, your point is it's easier to solve the problem of persistence level than actually Correct. Level. Correct. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so if we look at the configuration for something like this, first we have to specify the persistence layer. There are different um, persistence adapters for ActiveMQ. You can use something like, since the 5.7 level DB is, is available, for this, um, Kaha DB is still the, the default in there. You can set things such as the file persistence store, which is not as, I guess, friendly on a restart as Kaha DB because it doesn't do dynamic indexing. So what ends up happening is when you fail over and restart your ActiveMQ or fail over from one in instance to the other, your slave has to now re-index that file. And a lot of times when the failover happens, it's because you've got a ton of messages in there. Something's happened, something's gone down, you're filling up your queues, whatever the problem is. If you've got a ton of data in there and has to re-index, I mean, I've seen instances where it's taken 20, 25 minutes for to re-index that file. And obviously the concern there is if you see something like that, people automatically think, hey, ActiveMQ isn't failing over. No, it is. It's just taking a really long time. So using KahaDB alleviates that problem. So this is kind of the, the best of both worlds as far as uh, persisting to disk, but also having dynamic indexing. So it's a little bit slower than the file persistence store. It's quote, more so slower than like VM or in memory. But obviously what the problem with VM is that you're doing everything in memory. All bets are off as far as persistence goes. So if you fail over, well, there's no sense of failing over in a VM because once you lose that instance, you've lost your data. Um, so if you look at the, the broker configuration, 
Uh, <clears throat> here's the persistence adapter, transport connector, and then here we've got a, uh, an example of setting up a data source. So you don't have to use file. Like Kaha DB, you can use a JDBC persistence store. Again, you're paying the price for JDBC now. So not only are you paying persistence price, you're paying for JDBC also. This is extremely slow. Now it works, and since a lot of companies already have invested time and money and redundancy into their databases and things like that, they would much rather to pay the price of the, the, the slowness or the non-performance of JDBC in order to utilize the, the systems they already have in place. I don't always understand that logic, but hey, I understand money. Money talks. So the next piece of that is scaling out ActiveMQ. So now that you've got the concept of high availability, how do you scale that high availability system? So in this instance, what we're talking about is having a master, master one and master two. Each one of these have a slave. So what, what happens now is that if for some instance master one goes down, the slave takes over, this connection is reestablished and you're off and running. Now with your clients, they have the failover protocol. So anybody who's talking to this has a connection to this guy with a failover to this guy, this guy, or this guy. So if any time the client goes down, it can reconnect to any, any part of this network that's available. Now, of course, the first thing is, is well, I don't want to set up a, a URL that has four, or a, um, a connection URL that has four systems defined in it. Because if anything in this topology changes, now you've got to update clients. ActiveMQ is ahead of you on that one. ActiveMQ goes, well, let's go ahead and set it up with uh, um, update client cluster, which basically tells the client software that when I connect to master one, master one's going to go, we're, we've got it set up so that we're going to push all of my topology out to the client. So in, in reality, all you need to do is connect to one of these guys, have that update client cluster set to true, and it automatically updates your client with every system inside your network. So now, once you're connected, as long as you get that first connection, once you're connected, your client can now fail over to whatever system it needs when something happens to this topology. And there's an example of that in the, the configuration here in a minute. Um, but the other nice thing to that also is that if for some reason you add in a third master, so you're just running out of resources and you need another master in place in the messaging system. That update client cluster allows you to say, once I've, once I've changed my topology, I want my clients to redistribute those connections across all three of my brokers now. Because that obviously helps because now, not only do you scale your, your messaging system, but you want to scale the connections to those systems. Because if you just add in a broker without scaling your connections, you really haven't done anything. So if we're going to look at the connections for setting up a, the network of brokers. So here what I'm defining is how I'm connecting to, my, to the other brokers in my network. Now right here we have a static failover. This is also, the, if you look it up, there's also a static or a master-slave um, protocol also, which is defined by ActiveMQ that will tell it, here's my failovers for uh, my different system failovers that I'm going to use. There's multiple ways of defining this. Then what you've got is a duplex equals true. Um, that, that's just telling it, I'm going to instantiate my communication from one direction, whether it's through a firewall or something like that, and I'm going to allow two-way communication on it. That way your other systems don't have to define a connection back. So this defines interbroker communication. The transport connector is what defines when somebody connects to me, how do I want them connecting? And if you'll notice, this is where I'm specifying my update clients. So I'm telling, telling my system that basically any time a client or a connection comes in, I'm going to tell it how to, how to update that client with what information my, my uh, topology has. And then the other important piece of this is the NIO. That's a non-blocking TCP connection. So on your, on your connectors for your ActiveMQ instance, 
you'll want to make sure that you specify NIO as opposed to TCP. Now, if you're using, using the 5.9 and all that stuff, you'll see examples of this. Most of the configurations for ActiveMQ are now set up in a more enterprise-friendly way. And of course, we have the persistence adapter set up too here. So we just talked about the messaging system. Now we want to talk about how do, how do clients interface with this um, architecture? How are they going to talk to us? So in this case, we're just setting up a CXF endpoint. In this, we're, we're actually defining a web service endpoint. So the code that we'll see a little bit later is all based around a web service endpoint. This is, as, this is how easy it can be to set up a, a CXF endpoint within Camel. I'm just defining the endpoint, giving it a you know, bean ID for, for reference, telling it the address, the WSDL URL, and the service class. And then I can reference this ID right here in my, in my Camel code. This is the configuration piece. Of course, your WSDL has to be defined and all that. You know, I'm, I'm assuming there's certain things that are done already. But from a um, configuration standpoint for this architecture, it's literally this simple. Now I have a web service endpoint that is being published. And once you hit that from a, any client, this is the route that gets called. So that top piece, that top square in that architectural diagram is this piece right here. I mean, that's, that's one line of code, but it's multiple lines with breaks. But I mean, the idea there is, is I'm just pulling from the report domain. I'm doing a choice on it saying, okay, well, based on my WSDL, I have multiple um, operations that have been defined by my WSDL. But I want to check for, in this case, report domain. If it's a report domain, I'm going to convert my body of that, that incoming request, and then I'm going to send it off to ActiveMQ. All of that done in one line of code. I like saying one line of code, even though it's more. Sounds better. But this is the part that excites me. This is the one that you know, gets me all amped up, because I'm like, I can, I can write that whole line of code in several minutes. Now I get to spend the rest of my time testing, which is always my favorite. But I mean, all of that is, is what goes on the um, proxy layer. Simple, right? I mean, it's super easy. Now, of course, there's a configuration that goes along with this. It's not quite as simple as just saying ActiveMQ and it knows what to do. You have to define this. Because there are connections that have to be set up and configured. You want to use connection pooling. There's a lot of different things that this simple little route can completely screw up in your architecture. But making sure that you look those up and find out what those pieces are for a configuration standpoint will pay huge dividends. Because if you get this communicating correctly with JMS and producing your endpoint, now you've got a solid proxy that you can hammer with as many clients as you want. Nah. Obviously within reason. So once it's on the, the messaging system, we had the logic layer. And this is another piece to the camel web that we're weaving, is this is, we've got camel on the back end. We're, we're, we're pulling from the ActiveMQ endpoint. So again, we've defined ActiveMQ, we've got the configuration set up, and we can reference it via that name right there, once we have it defined. We're telling it Q, and I'm going to pull off Q domain. This goes and has a listener on that Q, pulls any messages that, that are coming in. In this case, I'm just setting a header, I'm setting it to a constant, and then I'm multicasting to multiple endpoints. So it's actually cut off down there. But basically what ends up happening is this piece right here does a multicast to these three pieces. So I'm sending it off to three routes simultaneously. That way I can get three times the work done in the same amount of time. And in this case, we're just saying I've, I've created these three beans that each wait a different amount of time on a thread. That's all it's doing. But the idea here is, is that depending on how long it takes each process to finish, I want each process to come back and, and hit the aggregator. This aggregator then takes it, aggregates based on the header, which we set up here. So you can have multiple messages coming in simultaneously, and it'll ag aggregate each, each message group back into the, the appropriate aggregator. So I've set my completion size because I've got three routes. So I say I've got, 
I'm expecting three returns off of these three routes for that one message header, and then I'm gonna log it. And then here what I'm doing is I'm just setting the header, and this is for the file component. So I'm just saying I want this as my, my file name when I go to write it out. And then I'm wiretapping it and sending it off to the file component. So that writes it separately from the actual process. Now, the aggregate, I'm doing my own custom aggregation strategy. One of the pieces to be aware of, who here has worked with Camel? Okay, so I'm preaching to the choir. You guys already probably know some of the, the, the problems that come with um, just assuming that the aggregation is actually gonna aggregate anything. Most of the time what ends up happening is if you try to do an aggregation, it's just gonna take the last message in and pass it on. So more than likely, you're gonna have to set your own aggregation strategy, and that's the piece down here. So this is what an aggregation might look like. Um, for the purposes of this uh, um, example, we, we're taking the aggregate, taking the old exchange, checking for null. If it's null, just return the new exchange because there's no, no sense in processing it. There's nothing there to, to aggregate. If it is, just go ahead and change some of the, in this case, some of the, the um, body elements from the, the messages coming in from the beans, and that's all it's really doing. So you'll get, to, you'll get to see in the example this getting written out several times. Is anybody here a UI guy? <laughs> Keeps his hand down here. Well, if you know back-end systems, then this will actually be a little bit interesting, but I've actually, I've actually gone to a conference where I had about 50% of the, all UI guys in the audience, and when I got to the point of showing them what I thought was really awesome, you know, they're looking at log files going, what, really? This is cool. All right, so the configuration of JMS. That's as simple as you can make it. I mean, granted, there's going to be more than this when you get to the actual configuration part of it, but, and this is actually one of, one of those pieces that we see a lot when we get out into the field and start firefighting because they've, they've done something like this without configuring um, the pooling mechanisms, um, and all, all of the, the back-end pieces that have to be put in place for ActiveMQ to actually function efficiently against the JMS uh, implementation. But for the purposes of this, it can be this simple. So once you've got your, your bean set up with ActiveMQ as the ID, now you can specify down here, this is how I'm communicating. So I've configured my broker here, and now I'm referencing it here. And that's how you make it so simple that it's literally just this, line, this, this um, prefix that is telling it how to communicate. So again, this is the, the, the proxy line, line of code. So with this configuration plus the CXF configuration, now you've got this in place. So there was what, maybe 10 lines of configuration that needed to be put in. I pause dramatically because I want everybody to, you know, sigh and go, wow. <laughs> so we, we've already talked about this. This is the next piece that I have off the screen, but I'm just going to mention it because I've actually run into a client here as of late that doesn't have testing in place, and I can't stress enough how important testing is in these systems because when you run into an issue, and I'm going to say when because you will, when you run into a, uh, an issue, not having the ability to test or recreate it or anything like that makes it a real headache to try and debug or do anything with because now you're basically debugging in production. And that's never a good thing. Here, I'll get off my little soapbox now because that's a big pet peeve that I've actually just worked with lately. So has everybody here worked with OSGI? Raise your hands if you've worked with OSGI. Okay, much far less than the uh, Camel implementation. All right, a lot of questions that I get when, I start, when we start going down the path of OSGI is, well, we have everything defined in Spring, and we don't want to switch it to Blueprint. Okay, why? This is a Blueprint configuration file. Here's the CXF endpoint, here's some beans, 
or here's the bean ID that, that instantiates the route, and here's my route builder that references that bean. It looks like Spring. If you take this out, it looks like Spring. Yes, the namespacing is a little different, but we won't talk about that. But other than that, there's nothing to be afraid of. So down here, we're just defining the bean. In the camel context, we're using this reference as my, my route. And then I'm telling the camel context this is the route that I've defined. Just like Spring. Look at Spring. It's pretty much the same thing. Of course, Spring makes it, whoops, makes it more complicated by make, enforcing you to import things and stuff like that. But it's not that much different. Blueprint, in my mind, is actually easier because they've built it to work in the OSGI environment. So that's kind of my way of saying don't be afraid of OSGI. Just because you, you shouldn't use Spring doesn't mean that you should be afraid of using OSGI. So those of you that were in the previous um, session, um, this is kind of the difference between these two systems. Carafe is pretty much all I build systems with anymore. Service Mix brings too much heavy weight to it. Um, unless you're familiar with what Service Mix is doing, much like Jeff and Johan are, um, you can rip stuff out of it. But really what you want to get down to is Carafe. I mean, that's where you want to be. And then you add to it what you need. You're much better off doing that than trying to take something and trying to rip everything back out because you're going to have problems trying to get it to, to function. So all Carafe is go ahead. are your main administration, provisioning, deployer, logging console. These are all the, the, the main pieces for your framework to uh, manage. And then it's got the, it, it basically wraps the OSGI container. Now, it, by default, it comes with Felix. But you can throw in um, Equinox also, or even Nopplerfish. Has anybody here worked with Nopplerfish? Yeah, okay, that should tell you everything. <laughs> so what Service Mix does is it just takes and says, hey, Carafe is great. It's got all these, um, this functionality that we need. Let's just drop it in here. And then we'll add in all these different frameworks. Things like, you know, I mean, JMS, which, which we would add, Camel, which is what we're adding. Spring is going to get added no matter what, basically. Um, there's different pieces of it uh, that's modularized, so hopefully you're only adding what you need. Uh, same thing with the web services and, and CXF even. JBI, to me, is dead. <laughs> so um, you don't need that anyway. So having that in service mix really doesn't do you any good. So from a configuration standpoint, when you start up your, your I'm going to say carafe, this is actually a, a service mix um, startup config, basically. You're basically telling it, here are the features that I want in place when I go to startup. Now, you have the ability to edit this and add your own features in there. So you can specify the repository for your feature definitions, and then you can tell it, I want these features when it boots up. And you can scale this back so that there's only the minimum needed when you boot up, because if you if you've looked at the camel code, who here's looked at the camel code? The camel code is very modularized, it's great, from the standpoint that almost every component within the camel code is its own feature. So you can install only what you need out of the camel framework, which is more than likely going to be camel core, and in the case of this architecture, you need camel CXF, and it's now activemq-camel, which is provided by the activemq um, people. That's about it. So looking at the architecture of these three systems, we've got the proxy, we've got the messaging layer, and we've got the business logic layer. Obviously, you're going to want to scale these at different levels. That's why the separation of functionality is very important. Because you're going to want to be able to scale the proxy layer depending on the number of clients. But those clients may be lightweight. They, there may not be a whole lot of logic functionality that, that requires or that is required from a resource standpoint when you have to scale the proxy layer, or vice versa. You may be scaling the logic layer because you have heavyweight processes on the back end, but not a lot of inter interaction from the outside world. Depending on how you need it or what's, what's going on in your environment, you can scale this at different, different levels. And that's, that's the important piece of that. Not only that, but your, your, your messaging layer more than likely won't have to scale at the same level as your other two systems. 
So at that point, active MQ, you, you might be able to get, get away with at one active MQ. And in most cases, when you start off with a new system or architecting a system, my recommendation is only use what you need. Don't over-architect your system. There's so many times I'll go into a place and they've added three, four brokers in there. And the first thing I'm going to ask is why. Why do you have four brokers in your system? Well, because we read that it's better. No, you've added complexity. Now your architecture is way harder. How much do you got going through there? Oh, we got, you know, 10 messages a minute. <laughs> really? I mean, you could do that in your sleep. I mean, it, take everything out. You know, do, remove all these extra active MQ. Let's put in failover. You're, you're done. You've removed a lot of complexity out of your system. So don't over-architect your system. Only do what is absolutely necessary. Scale when you need to scale. Don't do it because it's cool or, you know, you want to be one of the cool kids. Go outside and smoke a cigarette if you need to do that. All right, so this looks nasty, but it's actually a separation of, of how these systems are laid out from a hardware standpoint. So each one of these columns basically needs to be its own hardware. So each piece out of here needs to be separated. Now, can you run these on VM, stuff like that? Of course you can, but it still needs to be separate hardware from the standpoint of especially something like this where you have your master and slave from your active MQ, it's got to be different hardware. If you don't, you've lost the idea of, okay, well, now if one of these systems goes down from a hardware failure, you've lost both. Doesn't really do you any good to put them all on the same hardware. So making sure you separate that out. Um, so here's the, the proxy layer. We've got this service mix talking to both of these ActiveMQ instances. Here's a logic layer. He's talking to both of them. So if any one of these goes down, they can fail over. But with the client update, that's the key to this because now once he connects to this guy, he knows all of them. So he can fail over here. So when this guy comes back online, he sends an advisory to this guy and says, hey, I've, I've got my second ActiveMQ instance online, redistribute my load. So as soon as he comes back online, these guys and these guys all reconnect and distribute and load balance their connections across that system. Does that make sense to everybody? One of the other nice pieces is being able to set up clustering within these different layers. So you've got the ability using um, Seller within, I've got service mix up here, but within Carafe to cluster your nodes, which means you can configure these nodes in one place. So you can set up configuration and stuff like that through one of these nodes and it gets propagated to anything else on that, that node cluster. So in order to do this, you have to add in seller to your carafe instance or your service mix instance. And you do that just by running these commands with, within the console. So I guess I should step back and say, inside carafe, carafe provides a console for you to be able to interact with that, with that carafe instance. Using seller now, you can, you can now interact with all members of a cluster from one instance of the carafe console, the admin console. So once you've gotten into the, the admin console, now you can set up, excuse me, group lists. Um, you can create the, you know, or name the different groups within it. Um, here you're just getting a list of my nodes within a specific group. And here you can join nodes. You can tell, okay, what nodes do I want part of this group? You can set up multiple groups. So you've got a lot of control over all of your cluster from one admin console which is hugely popular from the standpoint that now you're not having to go out to each one of these and tell it how you want it configured. You can provide that from a single um, admin console. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is, well, I'll bring it up real quick. I have this code all functioning on my system so you can see a log file that's really awesome. That's the whole point of this. All right, let's bring that up quick. I better shrink that. All 
All right, this is going to be really hard. Do it this way. Much easier. By the way, these books are for people who ask really good questions. So think up some good questions as we go along here. All right, so what you see right here is a carafe instance. What I've got deployed at this point in here is the web service front end and the scatter gather logic layer. So these two pieces right here, 196, if I can get that highlighted, and 206. Actually, you know what, hold on. Let me make this bigger for you. Can everybody see that? Is it, I know the green on black is hard, but. Um, so what we can do now, there's actually, and the other nice thing about the console is that you get the ability to run commands from the command console that, that check the validity of your, your system at that point. So we can do what is it, list endpoints. So now that I've deployed my, my code, I can see that I have an endpoint available through the CXF endpoint in Carafe. So you can use the console to just also for debugging purposes to make sure that your system's configured correctly, make sure everything's working from that standpoint. Let's go ahead and go away. All right, so I'll start up my ActiveMQ instance. Okay, so that's the middle tier, it's up and running. Now all I need to do is hit my endpoint, which All right, so this is just SOAP UI. All I'm doing is hitting that endpoint now. And before I do that, let me tail. As you can see, I've tested this already, so I know it works. <laughs> it better work now. So now we should be able to hit that endpoint with our process. And all it's doing is it's, it, it's taking longer because, like I said, I set up several beans um, that just wait, and there we got our response. So what this is doing, and here's the, the log from the, the uh, Carafe instance. So you can see here that we've hit the back end, we've aggregated these messages, and pushed them forward. And you saw all the code it took to do that. I mean, from a proxy standpoint, from the messaging layer, all the way back to the logic layer, aggregating these, these three messages back together and passing them all the way back through the web service to the front, front end SOAP UI took hardly any code. The biggest, the biggest key to all this is making sure that you architect your system correctly. I mean, the code speaks for itself. You know, the idea there is that you're sitting there and you've got this whole system can be set up in, in a matter of an hour. Now the big question is, is did you do it right from a configuration standpoint or what you're trying to achieve with that architecture? But having the right tools and the right know-how to even go look for this, the, these possible issues are going to pay dividends down the, down the road uh, to no end. So are there any questions at this point? There's a free book in it for you. Uh -huh. is, there a, is there a limiting size on how many you should network together? Yes, uh, and 42. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that, that depends on your infrastructure. I mean, there's times that you know, the limit's going to be four. There's times, you know, and that's when you do a full mesh. I mean, you can use different topologies to really expand it to, to very large number of brokers, mm -hmm. um, but it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve. So if you're doing like a full mesh where you're just trying to scale the load across, let's say, five or six nodes, 
you know, you're, you're not going to need much more than that in a single mesh where they're all communicating. Now, if you need something where you're, you've got disparate brokers that are all on remote systems and you're deploying these on, on client sites and they're all communicating back to a specific broker, could you put you know, 40, 50 on there? Sure, you could put 40, 50 on there. You don't want them all meshed together. That's going to fail miserably. But then you change your topology of how the brokers connect to, to help support that. Catch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, tricky things with bringing OSGI into organizations is that so many people are used to Spring and, and deploying it with WAR files and things like that. So a lot of times the conversation comes down to operational support. Do you have any suggestions on dealing with operational teams and how you can advocate for that type of um, platform in those circumstances? Well, a lot of times, I mean, the biggest advocation for uh, an OSGI system is the idea that it, it requires less intervention from a downtime perspective. You know, you're not having to bring down systems and simultaneously and, and try to figure out, okay, when are we going to bring this system down and then bring this system down so that we can upgrade them and bring them back up together. Within OSGI, you've got the ability to say, well, you know what, we're not, we don't have to bring anything down. You just have to deploy this, this bundle back out here. It will restart. You'll have a couple of seconds of lag, but with this architecture, you can set it up so that you don't have those types of downtimes within a, an organization. Now, operationally, there's always the, well, how do we interact with this? Most of the time with, you know, since you have the ability to SSH into the, the command console, see what's going on, those types of things, a lot of times it actually becomes a, a, a I guess, a benefit to being able to use these types of systems and manage the bundles from an, uh, an SSH standpoint. Okay, those types of things. So just to summarize, you, you would advocate going at it from the perspective that, hey, you're going to have to do less because you don't mm -hmm. have to do a rolling, you know, stop and start to get things going mm -hmm. and demonstrate some of the command line functionality because that's fine natural to most sysadmins anyway. Right. Okay. And not only that, but you actually have the ability to get in there and actually manipulate the system directly with, you know, for your needs. Um, I have a question with uh, scaling uh, in ActiveMQ. Um, when it happens in, uh, during runtime, how does the client know that um, there is a new broker out there? Is, 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 it, is it with the configuration? Because the configuration doesn't say, like, you know, it's... Oh, how does each broker know that something changed in the topology? Um, no, how does, it, how does the client know, like, you know, that it, how does the configuration... Um, no, that there is one additional broker um, during oh, runtime. Right. Okay. Let me restate your question just to make sure I understand it. Um, how does the client understand when something in the topology in the no network of brokers has changed? It has changed. Or yes. even what's there? What's there? I mean, because it's the same it question. Yeah, it is the same question. Yeah. It's it's like. And uh, and when the when the client makes its first connection, now this is provided you set those parameters on the connection URL or on the um, transport connector. Mm -hmm. As long as you have those set, what happens is, is once he makes, establishes that connection, ActiveMQ broadcasts back to the client, here's the configuration that you need. Now, that only works if you're using the APIs. You know, if, okay. you're, if you're using some other, like, um, protocol that doesn't provide that, then all bets are off. But via the, the APIs and using TCP and I.O., that kind of thing, it's broadcast back to the client okay. so that the client then knows. And any time something changes in the, in the network, those advisories are sent throughout the network, and those get pushed back to the client also. So the client knows any time something has changed. Um, my question would be, um, I've seen that you are using a Camel CXF endpoint, uh -huh. and you already mentioned that uh, CXF does this web services stuff. Uh, so what would be your recommendation when to go directly to the CXF and uh, when to use common CXF integration, if ever? That's, uh, that's going to be, to me, that depends on load. You may get different answers from these guys. But I mean, the, the, the camel CXF endpoint isn't as efficient as handling um, the CXF calls as the CXF framework itself. So I mean, ideally, if you were to sit there, and, and, and this is more or less for simplicity standpoint, um, if you were to set up a high load system, more than likely what you probably do is set up CXF as a, as a complete 
front end separate from CAMEL and then make calls into CAMEL from that CXF um, configuration. Do you have one of these, Smolatch? No. Okay. So I wasn't involved, so as a disclaimer before I say that, my comp although my company uh, had rolled out service mix, ESB, and um, failed miserably. So now they are, all the places that you had service mix involved, mm -hmm. they're replacing with Tomcat. Um, okay. So they had service mix with uh, ActiveMQ in, embedded as well. Okay, there was so, a big problem. Yeah, so they went standalone ActiveMQ, okay. and then the next step is like, well, we don't need the ESB, we'll just use ActiveMQ between the Tomcats and the back, the logic and the front end. They had, the, as well, they had the Camel CXF, which they had pathing issues on how to separate the, the count. The number of paths went up, mm -hmm. uh, endpoints, or resource endpoints. Uh, so what do you, uh, so my question is, how do you, uh, what are they gonna lose from doing that? From replacing the service mix with the Tomcats and? Well, they, they lose the ability for um, like management or provisioning of your bundles. And, and I say bundles in you know, applications or war files or whatever they're, however they're deploying into, into Tomcat. Um, you know, from my standpoint, the, the provisioning of these systems, the, the administration that, that comes along with the, the ActiveMQ or the, the console mm -hmm. from within Carafe, those, that type of functionality to get hands into the system and being able to see what's going on at runtime and being able to change things like logging and things like that and also manipulate configuration files directly from the, the command console. There's just so many benefits to being able to utilize a, a system like Carafe that you lose in Tomcat. Now, based on the, what they're trying to achieve with Tomcat, I mean, was it a bad decision? It really kind of depends on what, what you're trying to achieve from your um, application. Um, yeah, I think it was a lot of OSGI, lack of knowledge with OSGI yeah. as well. And that, The other thing you'll end up losing from going to Tomcat is the ability to hot deploy over long periods of time. If you take a web application in Tomcat and you deploy, undeploy, deploy, undeploy many times and you end up with an uh, out-of-memory exception and that's because of the class loaders. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a mesh. So uh, you end up, you'll end up having to restart whereas in a carafe you'll be able to deploy, undeploy all day long without any corruption of the class loaders. So that's, that's a really big one. And then it really comes down to use case. What are you using it for? You know, if it's just a simple thing that pushes something active MQ and that's it, and it's just a web container, it might be good enough. But if you're doing a lot of data transformation and that sort of stuff, then you, Tomcat might have not have been the right choice to go to. What about the embedded active MQ? The yeah, that's because you're, you're sharing resources across two systems now in one JVM. So you got active MQ, which is a resource hog and you're trying to run it simultaneously in the same JVM as all of your applications, you're gonna get, yeah, it's, it's just not gonna work well. Okay, great, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much, Keith. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.